wedding dresses. <laughs> Not professionally, quite unprofessionally as a matter of fact, just as gifts for women I adore, a former student, my nieces, my sister, and women I consider sisters. The first one was actually my own back in 1991. Yes, thank you, 90s fashion, for those extra large sleeves. And yes, that guy and I, we are still married. Two kids, 27 years, 79 days, and 14 hours later, not that anyone's counting. <laughs> There's just one thing when I offer to make someone a dress. It comes with a warning and a request. Please do not show anyone the inside. The outside, I promise, will be absolutely gorgeous but the inside might be a bit messy, which is a lot like our actual relationships, right? We put up on the Facebook and the Insta, and we send out holiday cards of our cleaned up best relationship selves. We live in a culture where the tyranny of hashtag relationship goals has us so firmly in its grasp. So much perfection, so little time, it looks so easy from the outside. So a couple months ago, my husband and I celebrated that 27th wedding anniversary, and in the snail mail, we received a number of sweet cards, one from my sweet aunt, in which she wrote, you make it look so easy, exclamation point. And you think it would be easy, right? I mean, I'm a marriage researcher, <laughs> and I make wedding dresses. <laughs> my first popular press book was actually called What Happy Couples Do, although every day since its publication, my husband has been threatening to write the sequel. <laughs> and that sequel is called What Happy Couples Do, colon, the shit my wife wouldn't publish. <laughs> oh yes, he has got an entire dinner party stand-up routine about how hard it is being married to a marriage researcher. I should get a year and a half of credit for every year served. <laughs> My marriage is a petri dish, I'm a human communication guinea pig. <laughs> and part of the reason that's all so funny is because the secret of happy relationships, it's sort of hiding in plain sight there. It's that there is no shortcut. There are no perfect relationships, even for us experts. I mean, don't get me wrong, we have a happy, thriving marriage, or as the academic literature would say, a strong relationship culture, one that's somehow careening into its second quarter century. And yet the reality of our relationship, like all relationships, like yours and yours and, and you. <laughs> oh, I saw you out there earlier in the lobby. The reality of relationships is that they're messy. There's crap we would never publish. There's stuff we don't want to talk about. Like, for me, the painful breakup I had with my best friend about 15 years ago, and then the long but worth it road to repairing. She's actually in this audience today. <laughs> but let me back up and talk just a little bit about how I came to study this relationship stuff. So I actually majored in arts at a tiny liberal arts college in Wisconsin. And my senior year, I stumbled into a course called Interpersonal Communication, and I was like, holy Wisconsin dairy cow, people study this stuff. <laughs> As we academics like to say, research is me-search. In my family of origin, an incredibly loving and strong family, and to my parents, I say thank you for being the most awesomest humans ever. And in my family of origin, the implicit rule was don't talk about emotions, and the meta rule was don't talk about the fact that we don't talk about emotions. <laughs> and yet I'm sitting in this class learning that if you want to have the best of the best relationships, you've got to talk about all the things, especially emotions. And so it was game on. Fast forward a year, I'm in a master's and PhD program full on studying the microdynamics of relationships. And about two years in, I published my first peer-reviewed study in a fab journal, and all I could think was, yeah, I might actually get a job someday. And my parents were like, yeah, she might actually get a job someday. <laughs> and then something super weird happened. The media picked up on the findings of that little study. And I mean lots of media all over the world. Our simple little finding that couples who use nicknames and other types of private language also have happier marriages was now getting huge press. 
a simple correlation, yet an insight that was being talked about on morning radio and talk shows, newspapers and magazines, everywhere. I knew my academic self had made it big time when the National Enquirer reported on the study. <laughs> And year after year, for 25 years now, I have been getting at least annual calls from reporters to talk about that little study. I call it the study that wouldn't die. <laughs> and it's not that the data we received weren't fascinating. We had a front row seat to the creative ways that couples not only nickname each other, but nickname each other's body parts and develop private codes for talking about just about everything. Most frequently, Sexual activity, believing their children and grandchildren had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> I brought a few examples from our hundreds of bits of data because <laughs> you know you're thinking right now, we want examples. <laughs> so let's start with a few sweet spousal nicknames. Things like Schnookum, Sunshine, Sweet Cheeks, Sugar Lump, Lucky Pup, Little Sausage, Bigfoot, Nancy Drew, Honey Lumps, Chubby Cherry Queen Diamond, My Little Fruit Loop, My Little Corn Flake. <laughs> about 30% of our data were the secret codes that couples develop for talking about sex and sexual activity with one another. Playing Twister Picnic Time. <laughs> Humpty Dumpty Time to Pounce. <laughs> Walter's Lonesome Lubing the Chassis. Wilma's lonesome doing the twist. Fred wants to swim, Herbie meets Alice, and the infamous kids, it's your bedtime. <laughs> and couples did get incredibly creative when nicknaming each other's body parts. How about you use your best imagination to decide which of these might be her parts and which might be him parts? Mr. Mole, Mr. D. Enchilada Henrietta, Walter Chicky Jr. Gus, The Swamp. <laughs> Peppy Monster, Mr. Huge, Virgil Henry, Honey Pot, and USDA Choice. I mean, if you got a Honey Pot in some USDA Choice, you're gonna wanna make something with it. Yes, research can be fun, and the calls from reporters kept coming. And that little study that wouldn't die, it finally dawned on me why. I think it's because we want the secret. How is everybody else getting it right? We want the quick fix. But the reality is, folks, there isn't one. There's no drive-through marriage, there's no minute clinic for family drama. Yes, we've all experienced the conflict and anxiety not just romantic relationships or marriage, but of friendships gone bad, of families in turmoil, of work conflict that sent us into therapy. Speaking hypothetically, of course. <laughs> we inherently know that relationships are central to our identities and our well-being, so we're on the hunt for the insider's guide, the bottom line. And this collective desire to know has produced an incredibly profitable industry of books and products looking to make our relationships neater, cleaner, more joyful, as fast as possible. Like by Friday. Because <laughs> your marriage, your marriage can't wait until Monday. <laughs> we even have action figure sets, you and me, happy family together, action figure, free two-day shipping, an actual way to get a new husband by Friday. <laughs> and to, to be clear, I've contributed to this industry, and I'm not hating on some very fine books and authors simply looking to make our relationships and lives better. And we now have enough evidence to suggest that those efforts, those of helping you and me and little Fruit Loop out there have better relationships, <laughs> those efforts are literal lifesavers. Research by scholars like Dr. Julianne Holt Lundstedt and psychologist Susan Pinker and research coming out of the 75-year Harvard study of adult development currently being led by Dr. Robert Waldinger. 
and research by scholars from across a host of disciplines now gives us mountains of data to confirm that the single best predictor of how long you'll live is the quality of your close relationships and the level of your social integration. Social integration being defined as how many people do you talk to face to face as you go about your day? Not how much you tweet, not how large your following is on the Insta. Those things might actually be shortening your life. So I used to give couples the book, What Predicts Divorce, as a wedding gift, and suddenly I was being invited to way fewer weddings. <laughs> but my argument was, if you do want to have a long, thriving partnership, you really should know what not to do, as says the best science on the matter. And it's science like this, like that coming out of the Gottman Relationship Institute at the University of Washington, that might be the closest thing we do have to a secret. This is the research team that can predict divorce with 91% accuracy based on observing a few key communication behaviors of couples, like contempt. Contempt predicts divorce. Contempt is any expression that says without having to say anything at all, you're an idiot or who the hell cares? A microsecond eye roll. The Gottman team calls out contempt as cancer of marriage. Contempt in its first cousin, harsh tone and belligerent criticism, especially when used in the first three minutes of a conflict, that also predicts divorce. Hey asshole, with a side of eye roll, And to men in heterosexual marriages, you not being open to the influence of your wives, that also predicts divorce. The opposite didn't appear in the data because women not being open to the influence of men hasn't really been a thing in the history of always. <laughs> Lucky for my husband, I have learned the subtle art of sharing the science with him by leaving books around the house that he can stumble upon. <laughs> At the end of the day, what the Gottman research team and the therapists they train remind us is that marriage is not a big thing. It's a million little things. And the same goes for friendship. The same goes for family. The same goes for all relationships. Although to be fair, marriage does seem particularly complex. If we graph the average curve of happiness over decades of a couple being together, it'll look something like this. More accurately, this. <laughs> yes, messy and complicated. There's so many times in marriage, it's going to feel like you are getting your butt kicked and you will work your butt off. Actor, writer, producer Whitney Cummings defines marriage as being willing to die for someone who you yourself want to kill. <laughs> well-known marriage and family therapist, Esther Perel, the creator of my favorite ever podcast, Where Should We Begin?, where you get to listen in on actual couple therapy sessions. She recently shared her working definition of marriage with The New Yorker. Marriage, it's not a permanent state of enthusiasm. <laughs> Rather, she reminds us, it's a verb, a very active verb. I call Esther my academic Beyonce. She also calls out contemporary wedding vows as setting couples up for failure. The you are my everything. The I will make you well before you even know you're sick. Those kind of vows, she says, they're misguided. They're unrealistic. But she does offer us a more realistic vows that couple might consider. I'll F up on a regular basis and on occasion, I'll admit it. <laughs> my own crafty friend Kate recently gave me a hand embroidered pillow with a promise that I think couples might consider adding to their vows. I promise to do all things with kindness, you <laughs> funny little fudge muffin. <laughs> and while the world feels like it could use one extra large pillow right now, 
my own research reveals this truth, that we are many culture creators. We shape and stitch and build and mold the many cultures that are our homes, the micro cultures that are our marriages, the relationship cultures that are our friendships and our families. Those little cultures, those micro villages, they are the ones in which we are the queens and the congress, the kings and the garbage collectors, the tailors and the taco makers, the artists, the historians, the linguists, the ministers, the coaches, the all of it. And those are the cultures that will have the longest and greatest impact on not only our children and grandchildren, but on our own mental and physical health. And therein, I believe, lies the only secret that we need to know. Is that when your relationship feels like it's one big old disaster, when the simultaneous pulls of your partner wanting to reveal and conceal more, more autonomy and more connection, more novelty and more predictability, when the zigzag of your relationship feels like it's one big old mess, it doesn't necessarily mean you're doing anything wrong. I mean, you might be. But more likely, your relationship is perfectly imperfect, as it should be. And yes, no question, some relationships should absolutely be discarded. But my vow, it's to begin talking a lot more about the messes that are frequent and natural in and about my own relationships and yours. Oh, I see you, sweet pea. <laughs> because when we pretend that gorgeous on the outside is the entire picture, we do every other relationship that comes after ours one huge disservice. Thank you.